Come on, come on. 12, 15 on Super Bowl Sunday. You must really love the Lord. I got food to cook, so this is going to be really quick. Write, write down some notes. Got three points in three minutes, and we'll get out of here. <laughs> just kidding. Um, but we'll be out of here sooner than later, or, uh, or not. We'll just see what, what the Lord, who am I who did not, what the Lord will do. And maybe, he'll, maybe we'll be here till tomorrow. Um, hey, week five uh, of a series we're calling Our Reaction. We started this year uh, with this idea, with these two words, restore and rebuild. And we really felt like as we celebrated 10 years as a church, moving into year 11, that it was a year of rebuilding some things. And we used that, that verse in Jeremiah in the Old Testament that it's going to rebuild the, the palace, rebuild the nation on its ruins, on its former foundations. And so as we were praying about how do we start this year uh, as a church, we really thought that we would lay the foundation of, of who God has called us to be. We have a great commission to go into the world and make disciples. And we say that at Action Church, we exist to reach people where they are and connect them to everything that God has for their life. That is our mission. That is the great co-mission. But who are we as a church? What is our foundation, if you will? We believe that Jesus' action through his life, his death, and his resurrection demands a reaction from us. We're either going to reject it and do our own thing and spend eternity apart from God, or we're gonna receive it and our reaction will be to live out the rest of our life pursuing the things of God and pursuing that people will come into the same relationship that we have. We find our 10 reaction statements in 1 Timothy chapter four. We were praying about launching the church 11 years ago in that pre-launch phase of our, of our church plan. I remember God taking me to 1 Timothy chapter four, I was 29 years old at the time, and I remember this verse stuck out because Paul was writing to a young pastor who had just taken over leading the church in Ephesus, one of the early churches, and he writes this, this passage in 1 Timothy chapter 4, do not let anyone look down on you because you're young, but set an example for the believers in several different things. He talked about setting an example, and that example we talked about week one was a life of joy, that we're going to make it hard for people to go to hell by making it fun to go to church because Christians should be the most joy-filled people that we know. We've received something the world doesn't have and yet most times we're angry. We decided we're not gonna be a church. We're not gonna be Christians that have to be endured, but rather enjoy. We're gonna set an example. And then week one, we were set an example in what we say, or week two, in what we say. We are encouragers. Come on, this life can get tough and this life can get overwhelming and discouraging. So we decided early on, we're gonna be people that add courage to other people's journey, both through affirmation and through correction. We, uh, three, we talked about in how we live. We're going to set an example for the believers in how we live and how we're going to live at Action Church is like this, not like this. We're not called to hold on. We're called to be generous, that we are generous with our time and with our talent, with our resources, that if somebody needs it, and we may, we may be needed to be praying for the answer or we may be the answer, that we are generous. And then last week, we were going to set an example for the believers in our love. And our statement there was, we'll do anything short of sin to reach people with the gospel, that people matter to God. And the people that are far from God, but close to us are one intentional step, one intentional invitation, one intentional act of kindness or love from coming into a relationship with Jesus. We're going to do anything we can once we've been given grace and mercy, we're gonna do everything we can to extend that to people in hopes that they may meet Jesus. We use the story of Zacchaeus. Remember that he was saved in an instant because he met the person of Jesus. And if we can introduce people to the person of Jesus, then that can change everything in their life. Today, week five, we're gonna set example for the believers in our faith, in our faith. And our, our fifth reaction statement is this, is we believe God for immeasurably more, never just enough. Amen. Immeasurably more. Ephesians 3.20, now to him, Jesus, God, the Holy Spirit, now to him who's able to do abundantly, exceedingly, immeasurably more than we can ask, think, or even Imagine That's the type of faith that you and I are called to. Not, not, a, not a safe faith, not a measurable faith, but our God is able to do immeasurably more than what we can fit into here, than what we can see, an immeasurably more type of faith. I wrote it down this way as I was thinking about it this week. Faith is more than simply believing for God to provide. Faith believes God will provide more than enough. 
God often meets us at the level of our expectations. So at Action Church, we're going to do all we can and believe God for the immeasurably more. Faith is what's required in the gap of what we can do with measurable steps and what God can do when we put our faith in him. And we're going to talk about today, our job is to do everything we can and then where we fall short, we believe in faith for God to make up the difference. The things that God are, is calling you to and me to, our church to, cannot be accomplished on our own. If we could do it on our own and it wouldn't require faith, then it wouldn't be from God. And I believe there are two types of people in this room, and this is not a political statement or something that should offend you. It's a joke, so just go with me. There's male and there's female, and males uh, uh, oftentimes op uh, uh, operate in measurable faith, and, uh, and girls often operate in immeasurable faith. It's called girl math. And... Uh, <laughs> If you're not new, it's a trend right now. And girl math is not real math, but it may be the type of faith that you and I need. Let me, let me illustrate. I was, I was taking Gabby uh, just a few weeks ago. Uh, her birthday is January 20th. And we went to New York City for her birthday. I, I, I love experiences over gifts. I'm an experienced guy and she is as well. And so we were gonna go have an experience together. Go to New York, do the tourist thing, do a great dinner and hotel and a show. And we get there. And she's like, hey, you know, we had some time uh, one of the days. She's like, let's go shopping. And I was like, oh, I'm okay. Um, I, the, this was the shopping. This was the trip. This was, this, is, surprise, happy birthday. <laughs> Me and your favorite city and all the plans, like that's, that's it. Like we're done. She goes, well, I just figured, you know, since this trip was free, we can go shopping. <laughs> free? She goes, yeah, we paid for all this on, on points. Well, how do, you, how do you think we got those points? <laughs> Money left our account into something else. And now those, this isn't free. This was paid for just before this happened. Come on, girl, math. Like it was 40% off. You still spent 60% of our money. <laughs> well, I got a discount because I bought five. It was buy four, get the fifth one free. We didn't need one. <laughs> Oh, it was free because I returned some stuff and then I used the return gift card to buy it. So it was basically free. Still the same amount of money. <laughs> Having a lot of fun, but what we need in our faith, we need to operate with some girl math. <laughs> that there is more available. Come on, come on. There's more power. There's more resource. There, God has access to everything. And yet we settle for just what we can understand. Wow. What we can fit in here, what we can figure out. And I'm here to tell you, if you can figure it out, it doesn't require faith. And nothing that we do for God should be done with, without faith is impossible to please That's God, right. the Bible says. Right. So faith is the currency. Faith is the foundation. So you and I need to go on a journey of finding an immeasurable faith. When we don't have enough, we, we need some faith. When we don't have what we thought we would have, we need some faith. When our kids are struggling, we need some faith. When our marriage is struggling, we need some faith. Anybody in here just had a season of your life, there's been something going on where you say like, God, I need you to show up. Like, like I need a miracle in my life. Like I need a miracle in this relationship. I need a miracle with this bill that's due. I need a miracle. If you find yourself in need of a miracle, oftentimes God's got you there because he wants to see, see where your trust will be, see where your faith will be. I wanna go to scripture uh, this afternoon, 2 Kings chapter four. One of my favorite stories in all of scripture because it's so simple, it's just seven verses. But I really believe in these seven verses, practically we're gonna find not only something that will inspire us to, to believe God for more, but I really believe uh, the author here articulates it in such a way that we can take this passage and practically apply it to our life when we need some immeasurably more type faith, when we need God to show up in a supernatural way. I really believe through this widow's journey and through this prophet's journey here in 2 Kings chapter four, we see a lot of tangible, practical things that if we will do in our seasons of waiting, in our seasons of struggle, when we need a miracle, I believe it will set us up for God to move. Can I just pause for a second? And that's what faith does. Faith lays a foundation. Faith gives God the ability to move. Can I just come and get some bad theology that faith does not obligate God to do anything? 
God is God and you are not. Therefore, how you pray, what you pray, what you fast, what you say, God is not a formula, he is a father. And the power of God is never mandated or dictated based off a formula for man. And so when I talk about God moving, faith allows God to move, but doesn't force him to move because God is not mandated by you. The created could never tell the creator how and what he should do. That was a little quiet in all services. There has been some bad theology. If I do this, I get this. If that was the case, you wouldn't need a relationship. Relationships are not formulas. Put formulas in a calculator. You don't use them in authentic relationships. Faith is not a formula. It's a foundation. Uh, 2 Kings chapter four, let's read it together. One day, the widow of a member of the group of prophets came to Elisha and she cried out, my husband who served you is dead and you know how he feared the Lord. But now a creditor has come threatening to take away my sons as slaves. What can I do to help you? Elisha asked, tell me, what do you have in the house? Nothing at all except a flask of olive oil, she replied. And Elisha said, borrow as many empty jars as you can from your friends and neighbors. Then go into your house with your, with your sons and shut the door behind you. Pour olive oil from, uh, pour oil from your flask into the jars, setting each one aside when it's filled. So she did as she was told. Her sons kept bringing jars to her and she filled one after another. Soon every container was full to the brim. Bring me another jar, she said to one of her sons. There aren't any more, he told her. And then the olive oil, it stopped flowing. When she told the man of God what had happened, he said to her, now sell the olive oil and pay your debts and you and your sons can live on what is left over. I see the the recipe for the miracle in this story. The first one in verse one, she cried out. When's the last time you were so desperate in your pursuit of God, you were so desperate to pursue the things of God, you were so desperate in your situation where you cried out? A lot of times we include, we talk, we, we ask God, when's the last time you were so desperate that you cried out, God, I need more of you, God, I need you to show up. She didn't just ask the prophet, she cried out. And before uh, we get too far, I want to make sure you understand that in the Old Testament, there were priests that made sacrifices to atone for the sins of people. And in this season, the prophets would hear from God and speak on behalf of God. So when we see how this woman treats the, the man of God, the prophet of God, we can extrapolate that to our relationship in the new covenant since Jesus, now that we have direct access to the Holy Spirit, that what she is approaching the prophet for is how you and I can approach God. Amen. She cried out. And oftentimes we wait until the end to cry out. Why does God move so powerfully? Why do we grow so much in seasons when we're at the bottom or when the bottom falls out? It's because until the bottom falls out, we try and control. We try and do all that we can do and then we go to God at the end. My pastor, Pastor Chris Hodges, will be here in a couple weeks speaking at the end of the month. He always used to say when I was at Church of the Highlands, prayer should never be a last resort, but a first response. And a foundation for miracle is faith. And a foundation for faith is your prayer life with God. When is the last time you cried out and said, God, I can't do this without you. And I don't want to do this without you. What am I supposed to do? Your prayer life is so important to your immeasurably more faith journey. I'd rather you pray than not pray. But I want to challenge you today to not settle for what I want to call this afternoon measurable prayers. I want to pray immeasurably more. If my God is able to do more than I could think, ask or imagine, why would I settle for measurable? Why would I settle for like, God, give me just enough measurable. And it sounds selfless, but it's kind of selfish. God, I don't want to bother you. I don't want you to take any from anybody else. Just give me, just give me just enough. That's such a scarcity mindset that he's going to run out of anything. He's infinite. Uh, What about this one? God, God, keep me safe. And I'm not saying don't pray for safety for you and your family, but God, here's what I mean. God, God, keep me comfortable. Keep me in this little bubble of security and safety and control. Measurable about this measurable prayer. God, God, change my situation. God, change my boss, change my kids, 
Change my spouse. Can't pray that one. That's not God. God's not telling you to change your spouse. Those are measurable. What about immeasurable prayers? God blessed me with abundance so I can be a blessing to others. God, don't, don't keep me safe. Make me effective. I'm not going to settle for safety when I've been called to go into the world and make disciples. Like, I don't want to just sit back and be comfortable. I want to be effective. And comfort is always the enemy of effectiveness. You will never be effective for the kingdom of God. You will never operate in miracles and see God do immeasurably more from safety and comfort. Immeasurable prayers would be, God, don't, don't change my situation. If you need to, do it. But use me in the middle of my situation for others' benefit and for your glory. What if God allowed that situation because he needed you in that situation for the purpose that he had for you? Sometimes we're just praying the wrong thing. We're praying from our preference and from our will and from what we can figure out. And the whole point of crying out or praying is to release control and to give it to God. Let's keep reading together. Verse two. Verse two, it says this. It says, what can I do to help you, Elisha asked. And I want to stop right there because uh, what can I do to help you was his response. And the reason that was his response is based off of the life that her husband, her late husband had lived. See, he feared the Lord. He was faithful in, in serving Elisha. So when he, his family needed help, the response is, what can I do to help? Because his life had had prepared for that moment. He was a part of the group of prophets. He was faithful in what he was supposed to be doing. So when he and his needed help, the response was, what can I do to help? And I just want to let you know today, I don't know how long you've been here, but if you call Action Church home, if you are a member of Action Church, like this family was a member of the group of prophets, if you need something, our response is, what can I do to help? How, how am I a member here? You give or you serve here. Your life is invested here. When you need help, and I've talked to several people throughout this morning. This, this is a promise that we will fulfill. You need help. We will do everything we can to help you. You find yourself in a time of need. The answer is yes. Through partners, through resources, through our benevolence fund that we give away uh, every single year to our church members. What can I do to help? But here's going to be the question from Action Church. Here's the question from the prophet. And here's the question from God. When you cry out to God and say, I have a need. I am believing for something. I need something. The response is, what can I do to help? But check out the next one. What do you have to offer? Right, right. Because there's always something measurable that we bring to the table for God to add the immeasurable. God will always ask you to give what we have so that we can get what we never could without him. There is something that you and I have. There is a part that we play in the miracle. It is measurable, it's not immeasurable. It is natural, it is not supernatural, but God is looking for what we have. What we have oftentimes is the ingredients or some of the ingredients for the miraculous, for the immeasurably more. Let's keep reading together in verse three. Verse three, it says this. It says, and Elisha said, borrow as many empty jars as you can from your friends and neighbors. You need to understand this afternoon that these jars in this story, these vessels in this story, they were borrowed for a reason because you cannot own the gifts of God. You cannot own the miracle. We are simply stewards. We are simply vessels. So gather as many empty jars as you can. And that is what God is trying to do in and through the local church to gather as many empty vessels to pour out his power in. It's borrowed. Once they were done, they were returned. Sound familiar? We're here. We're given life. We're given gifts. We're given passions. We're given access to the power of God. And then once we're done, we're returned to our Father in heaven if we meet Jesus. And the calling and the cause and the power keep being poured out. Why? Because it's not about us. We are included in it. You can be a part of the miracle, but you are never the, you can be a vessel, but you're never the source. It's borrowed to show us that our gifts are borrowed, our talent is borrowed, our time is borrowed. It is not our own. Once we give our life to Jesus, our life is not our own. It is a borrowed time, something that we do not own. Once they were used, the jars would be returned. The vessels were to hold the oil, to hold the value, to hold the power, nothing more and nothing less. Verse four, it says this, now then go into your house with your sons and shut the door behind you 
Simply, there are some things that God wants to do in you before he does things through you. There are things that God needs to work out in private before he promotes you in public. Before the miracle happens, he said, go in there and shut the door. There's some things that God wants to reveal in you. There's some things that God wants to reveal to you in private before you walk it out publicly because he cares more about your character than, than the 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 destination in which you're going. He wants you to become better, not just do something for him. They go in and they, they shut the door because something needed to happen on the inside of them before the miraculous came. It goes on to say, uh, pour olive oil from your flask. Again, what do you have to offer? Pour olive oil from your flask. If you think about this, I missed this for so many years. She says, I have nothing. And... But, but, this, but this olive oil. And so she had nothing else. In fact, she was so poor that the only way she could pay off the debts of the creditors would be to sell her sons as slaves. So when she gives this flask of oil, when she pours out, when she trusts the prophet Elisha, when she trusts God and she pours out, she's not pouring out something small. She's pouring out the only thing of value she has left. She is saying, I trust you. It's small to us, but everything to her. And our sacrifice, our sacrifice develops our faith. Your level of sacrifice develops your faith. What are you willing to give up? What are you willing to give God access to? What are you willing to set aside for others' benefit and for, for his glory? Your level of sacrifice develops your faith. Verse five says, so she did as she was told. Come on, let's read that again. So she did as she was told. So you did as you were told. Man, we hate that in 2024, don't we? Ain't nobody telling me what to do. I'm a grown man. Make my own decisions. Not not with God. That sounds really good to get all big and strong when you're talking to somebody else, but it sounds a little ridiculous when you're talking about to the creators of the heavens and the earth. (laughs) Write this down. Your level of obedience demonstrates your faith. There's something that God is asking you to do, and until you do it, he can't trust you with more. Until he can trust you with the measurable steps, why would he ever give you the immeasurably more? We hate it. We're in a society that loves to learn, loves podcasts. We love mentors. We just hate being mentored. (laughs) We love the idea of it. We just don't want anybody to tell us to do anything differently. And if we get a mentor that tells us the wrong thing, we'll just go find a different one. (laughs) Most of us aren't looking for a mentor. We're looking for a mirror. Because we're just going to do whatever we want to do either way. And I'm here to tell you, you're not going to operate in the immeasurably more in the miracles of God if you're not obedient. Why would he trust you with more when he can't trust you with what you already have? And your level of obedience, obedience, it demonstrates your faith. Pastor, are you saying if I'm not obedient, then I don't have faith? Yes. That's exactly what I'm saying. And if a certain point, God does not have the right to be right and you be wrong, then you have not submitted your life to him. And you're not living a life of faith. Third service may be a little tired. You're not a Christian. Wow. If God doesn't have the right to be in control of your life, you are not saved. The whole point is to confess him as Lord and surrender. And so not only can you not live a life of a measure of more faith, you can, you're not even on a faith journey yet if God cannot tell you what to do. And when you disagree with him, you submit. If you don't submit, then he's not your Lord. If he's not your Lord, then he can never be your savior. Your level of obedience, it demonstrates, so it demonstrates yeah. your faith. Wow. That, wasn't, that wasn't popular, but it was true. Yes. The next one is this. It talks about her sons. She, just, she was told her sons kept bringing jars to her and she filled one after the other. This is just real simple. Sometimes people are a part of the miracle that never get the credit. Like I look at all of our teams here, all of our outreach teams, all of our setup teams at our portable location, all of our parking teams, kids team. I look at so many people. The miracle never happens here. The, the oil is never multiplied. The, the debts are never paid without the sweat of the sons. So we look at the faith of the widow. We look at the truth of the man of God, Elisha. 
But if we're not careful, we'll, mi- we'll, we'll miss that without the sons going door to door, knocking, sweating, working all day to gather the jars, without the jars, there's no place to put the oil. Yes. And so, so many times we miss out and we give credit to the people that we see. We don't understand that there's a lot more people involved in the miracle of Action Church and the miracle of reaching and connecting tens of thousands of people that without the sweat of the sons, there are no jars. And without the jars, there is no place to put the oil. So the sweat of the sons, don't, don't let anybody discount your part in the miracle. Look at the next thing. It says they were, they were filled to the brim. They were filled to the brim. God is not a God of just enough. He gives us all that we need to accomplish what he's calling us to accomplish. That she responded with, I have nothing. And really she had everything. The oil was all she needed. Oil in the Old Testament represented the Holy Spirit, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So we have vessels and we have oil. All God needs is an empty vessel full of his power to do everything that he needs to do. She said, I have nothing. And you may be saying that this afternoon, Pastor, you don't understand, I have nothing to offer. If you have emptied you, surrendered your life to Jesus, and then you are full to the brim of the anointing of the Holy Spirit, you don't have nothing, you have everything you need. Like that, he doesn't, we're not as big of a part of this as we think. He needs a willing, humble, obedient vessel to say, here I am, send me whatever you need. I'm here. I don't need to be full of me. I need to be full of you, oil and vessels. We are the vessels. He is the oil. We are stewards. You know, without, without vessels, there's nowhere to put the oil. Pastor, are you saying without people that God will will cease to move? I I would never say that in totality for the rest of time, but from my understanding of scripture, what I see now is God chose to use people. The Holy Spirit indwells in people and people carry the the, the power and the presence of God. So therefore, for God to move, he needs vessels. Now he chose to operate in that way. He doesn't need us. He chose to use us but the oil didn't stop flowing. Verse six, hey, get me another jar. The oil's still going. One flask, jar after jar after jar. The oil didn't stop flowing because the the flask ran out of oil. The oil stopped flowing because there was nowhere else to put it. God doesn't stop moving in our life because he runs out of power. We run out of a place for him. God doesn't stop using and growing a church because he takes his hand off of them. There's no more jars. There's no more people to bless. There's no more people to send because we've settled for, I'm good. My God. We're full to the brim. My kids are good. My family's good. Pastor, I love freedom. Never going to lead it. I got my freedom. I'm going to sit on it. <laughs> got my seat, got my parking spot. I'm good to go. I'm full. No, 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 no. When we run out of jars, God stops pouring out the oil. We need to gather more jars. Amen. Amen. It stops flowing because God doesn't waste anything. It stops flowing because God's not gonna spill oil on the floor. Because when oil gets spilled on the floor, it makes a mess and people get hurt. So we lose influence, we lose momentum, we lose the power of God moving us forward when we stop gathering jars, when there's no longer a place to put the power of God. There's no longer a place to hold what he wants to do. We need to gather some jars. We need more people leading. We need more people serving. We need more people living in their potential. We need more people to say less of me and more of you. I empty myself so that you can fill me to the brim. I missed this earlier, but it says they filled to the brim and once they were full, they set them aside. You are set aside for a special purpose. God created you on purpose and for a purpose to be filled up and set aside. What does this mean for you? It means you need to gather some jars in your family. This isn't just a missional thing. This isn't just a church message. It's just for you. You got a need. God's asking you to take some measurable steps. What do you have? What do you need to get? You ever notice this? The miracle. The boys were in the home. Widow was there. Flask was there. 
They had some jars and they had access to jars. Did you notice that the ingredients for the miracle were there the whole time? Just one step of sacrifice away from, from starting to put those ingredients in motion. Just one step of obedience away from saying, God, you can trust me with this miracle. That's the gospel, by the way, verse seven. Oil stopped flowing, jars were full, they sold the oil, paid off all their debts. And the prophet says, take the rest, take the rest and live on it. That's the gospel that Jesus would leave heaven and invade earth, live perfectly because you could not die because you and I deserved it. That life and that death paid our debts. The greatest miracle of all time. But then he says, hey, I got more. I got a resurrection coming. I'm defeating death. I'm defeating the grave. And I'm giving you some power. I'm giving you a comfort. I'm not just paying your debts. I'm giving you something to live on. My presence and my power. Verse seven is the picture of the gospel that our debts have been paid and he's given us all we need to live on both in this life and the next. And you are one decision of surrender away. from allowing God to be the Lord and the Savior and the Redeemer of your life. He has so much more for you. If you could just stop, if I could just stop settling for what we see and what we control and believe God for measure more, not just enough. I wanna give you something practical this afternoon. There's a card on your your chair uh, when you came in and a pen as well. It's Ephesians 3.20 and 21. And I've just been praying and believing. I believe God's gonna answer some prayers. He's gonna work out some miracles. You're gonna have some sacrifice and some obedience involved, but He's gonna do what you could never do on your own. I'd love for you to write down this afternoon or this week, just some immeasurably more prayers for you, for your family, for your current struggle, for your calling, for your purpose. I don't know what it is, but you do. And I want you to put it somewhere, your car, bathroom, somewhere in your home. And every time you see it, I want you to begin to pray. Here's my challenge. I I want you to write some things down here. I want you to write some things that you don't whisper, but that you cry out. Like some things, some things that you just need God to move in. We're gonna pray for these at the end of of service. What I'd love to do right now is, is give anybody here an opportunity. If you've never started that relationship with Jesus, there is not access to immeasurably more unless you have a foundation of a relationship with Jesus. So we've talked around it, we've talked about it, but I'd love to pray with you this afternoon if you would bow your heads and close your eyes. The truth is, church, that no sermons ever saved anybody. It's the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's been speaking to you, whether through worship or through the prayer, through the reading of 2 Kings 4, but you know today is your day of salvation or today is your day of recommitment that God brought you here today because something needed to change. You no longer need to be in control, but you're giving control to Him. Pastor, how do I do that? Romans 10. When we confess with our mouth and we believe in our heart that Jesus is our Lord, as we can and will be saved. I wanna give you that opportunity this afternoon to make that decision, the best decision of your life. The Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now and you know that it's your day to surrender your life to His Lordship. I'd love to pray for you. If that's you this afternoon and you wanna make that decision to follow Jesus, I'd love to lead you in that prayer. If that is you for the first time, or maybe I'm recommitting your life for the first time in a long time, you say, Pastor, I want to make that decision to make Jesus the Lord of my life. Would you raise your hand right where you are and say, I need to start or restart a relationship with Jesus. I got one, two in the middle, three, four right here. Yes, ma'am. Got you in the back, a couple more. Yes, ma'am, got you in the front over here. Right back there in the middle. Got you in the back. Went by the stadium, see ya. Just know that there's a different and better way to live and the Holy Spirit is, is leading you right now. It's, what you're feeling is called conviction. The Bible says that conviction leads us to repentance of changing our ways, of returning to God and things He has for us. You can put your hands down. If you raised your hand, would you pray this in your heart as I pray it out loud? Say this, say, God, I love you. And God, I thank you for saving me. God, I acknowledge that I'm a sinner in need of a savior. And I repent from those sins. 
I do confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that you, Jesus, are Lord. And God, I give you that place today, complete and total control. Have your way in my life. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. I thank you for meeting us here this afternoon. We love you. We worship you. It is in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody at Action Church said amen and amen. Can we celebrate all the decisions that were just made? So proud of you.